Like all museums, the Canadian Museum of Flight draws visitors in with its historic articles. Engines, propellers, cockpits, diagrams, and even full-sized planes are everywhere on display for guests to see. We had a chance to visit the museum and talk to Al French, who has a long history with flying and now helps at the museum. I think people, a lot of people take flying for granted. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's so much a part of our life here traveling, it's the safest way to travel. There was a lot of tenacity and determination and sacrifice into make, that went into making flying what it is today. Uh, our first world war flyers, obviously, they didn't know what they were doing. They were like the earliest explorers and they were just climbing into these rickety kites and uh, learning how to do it. The museum is home to a number of individuals who are bound together by their love of aircraft. Uh, it's an interesting group of volunteers. Uh, some of us are pilots. We have some retired uh, airline maintenance managers wearing the tools that they wore when they were apprentices. Memories hold a power over our lives that cannot be explained and play an important role in shaping our future. Most recently, I've got to say, Vimy Ridge was such an adventure, you know, going over there and being part of the flying team that commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Um, going over to France and the, the, the warm welcome that we got from the French people and uh, just being a part of that emotional experience of commemorating the sacrifice that our earliest aviators made. The next time you're in Langley, British Columbia and looking for a great way to make memories, be sure to check out Canadian Museum of Flight. To discover more ways for you to make lasting, meaningful memories with family and friends, like and subscribe to follow along with This Life BC as we explore other unique places in British Columbia to enjoy. Special thanks to Alternatives for their commitment and support with reminders like this to live life to its fullest every day. Humans have longed to take to the sky and fly for centuries. On December 17, 1903, this dream became a reality as the Wright brothers performed the first powered, controlled, sustained flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in a heavier-than-air aircraft. Since that day, the power of flight has been harnessed and evolved as new innovations in wing design, engines, and controls have changed the way we take to the sky. The Canadian Museum of Flight in Langley, British Columbia follows the timeline of this evolution in travel, as well as memorializing many of the aviators, mechanics, and engineers who had a part in its history. The memories embodied in the airplanes, photographs, engines, and even many of those who work at the museum bring history to life for every visitor. We had a chance to visit the museum and talk to Al French, who has a long history with flying and now helps at the museum. My name is Al French. I'm with the uh, Langley-based Canadian Museum of Flight here at the Langley Airport, beautiful British Columbia. I've been a pilot for 55 years. Started flying when I was 15 years old with the Air Cadets. Joined the Air Force when I was 17. I had an eight-year career flying fighters in the Air Force. And then I uh, got out and spent 33 years flying airliners for uh, uh, Canadian Pacific Airlines, Canadian Airlines, and uh, Air Canada. Uh, right now, as a retired pilot, I spend a lot of my time here at the museum working with other volunteers. The museum is home to a number of individuals who are bound together by their love of aircraft. Al talks about what it's like to be involved at the museum and what they do. Restoring and maintaining airplanes, it's an interesting group of volunteers. Uh, some of us are pilots. More likely, we have some retired airline maintenance managers that are just glad to be back and wearing the tools that they wore when they were apprentices and getting back to their roots in aviation. It's kind of a social experience for us as well. I'm learning from them, they're learning from me. We're, learning, we're all learning from each other and getting back to where we started off in aviation. It's kind of fun. It's a really good social environment for all of us old retired guys to, to get together and, and just work together and learn from each other. It's just, I've learned so much in building these airplanes. You know, I've, as a pilot, I was never much interested in getting into the nitty gritty and, and what, what an airplane was. Uh, you know, obviously I knew I, from, a, from an abstract, from an abstract point what, what, what went into it. It was, it was part of our education, but to actually get down and dirty and and start wrenching and tightening nuts and having a mechanic say, no, no, that, that's on the wrong way. You know, the washer's got to go on this side, you know, and it's got to be to this tension. And this is how you, this is how you put a cotter pin through a, through a bolt. And this is, it's, it's just, I've, you know, I've learned so much from these guys and it's, and vice versa, I guess. It's just kind of cool.
And it's it's a lot of fun dealing with experimental airplanes too. These are all these are these are all experimental. All well, they're, they're classified as experimental. So uh, you can do more stuff and you can innovate more than you could if it was a certified airplane. If it was a certified airplane that you carried passengers in, you, obviously Transport Canada has much more control over what you can do. But uh, here at the museum, it's just just us dumb guys that are flying them without passengers so they really don't they really don't pay attention very much to what we do with them they figure we're smart enough to 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 not kill ourselves <laughs> Like all museums, the Canadian Museum of Flight draws visitors in with its historic articles. Engines, propellers, cockpits, diagrams, and even full-sized planes are everywhere on display for guests to see. We've, we've kind of set up the museum here as a timeline. So we've started off as, this is the Wright Flyer, the first airplane that ever flew, and then the Silver Dart flew in Canada. And then from then we've gone on to World War I. You can see how airplanes have evolved in those years, you know. It's, uh, and then uh, we get on to World War II where airplanes started to uh, become uh, purpose designed so that the fighters looked like fighters and the uh, utility airplanes started to look like utility airplanes and bombers started to look like bombers. We've got a few uh, display cases here that show things like a, a World War II fighter airfield in, in Britain with the Spitfires and the Hurricanes taking off and these are of interest to a lot of people and a few displays that are uh, out of people's personal memoirs like logbooks and things like that. So these are all memories that uh, people wanted to make sure that weren't lost in attics somewhere or in basements or moldering away in boxes so they bring them to me in the museum and share them. Uh, great display of engines here, all the different kinds. We've got inline engines, we've got water-cooled engines, we've got air-cooled engines. Some of them are specifically purposed. This one, I like to say, is the engine that won the war. This is the Merlin engine. They had this on everything. This is the engine that was in the Spitfire. This was in the Mosquito bomber. This was in later versions of the Mustang, and it was on the Lancaster bomber. They hung this engine on everything. And we made hundreds of thousands of these. The big rotary engines, very powerful. They hung these on the bombers, obviously. If you've got a rotary engine, you can get all the cylinders out in front and get better air cooling over the fins. The drawback, again, was there was more drag because of the higher frontal profile. Early link trainer, so this is where novice pilots would learn how to do their instrument training in there. They could put a hood over the top and it's like a little toy airplane. So we've got some cutaways of uh, piston engines and uh, jets, the earliest jet engines. And then uh, turboprop engines and helicopter engines. Uh, then we get on in here to our uh, airplanes that we still fly today. Uh, actually, all the airplanes on the floor here we do fly. Some of them are in various states of airworthiness right now. We just don't have the room to work on them in here all the time. This is our Fleet Canuck. This is our uh, training airplane. So we do our competency flying and our currency flying in here and check each other out. The museum acquired this and we restored it to flying status ourselves. This airplane here, interesting, this was built by one of our museum members in 1973. And it's a 7-8 um, scale of an SE-5. SE-5 stands for Scout Experimental. Uh, these came online during the war in, in probably mid-1916. So these were flying in uh, the Battle of Arras and the Battle of, of Vimy Ridge. Um, this airplane here is a Sopwith Pup. We built two of these uh, specifically to take over to the 100th anniversary commemoration of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which was on April 9th, 2017. Our two pups didn't have enough flying experience to fly over in France, so we had them on static display, but this one did. And this was one of the airplanes uh, that flew over the monument on the day of the 100th anniversary. And uh, Prince Charles was officiating, and uh, Prince William and Harry were there, and Justin Trudeau and 22,000 Canadians, and we uh, kept the memories alive, trying to make sure that people remembered what an important role aviation had in that Battle of Vimy Ridge. Taking photographs, making sure the troops know what the objectives were, and getting air superiority over the trenches. We've got some other airplanes here that their vintage is uh, kind of between the wars. We've got a Tiger Moth that was a trainer. It's being rebuilt at the moment. It's INF, a Waco a biplane, and then there's another Waco biplane that's bigger. It's got an interior cabin. And then we've got a Mustang uh, replica over there as well. That's uh, pretty much our inside co collection. Al dreamed of flying fighters since he was a small child. 
He joined the military as a fighter pilot in an attempt to fulfill that childhood dream. Yeah, the first, the first day I flew the, uh, I got my pilot's wings and I went to Chatham, New Brunswick and we had to check out on the uh, F-86 Sabre jet. They gave us 65 hours on the Sabre jet before we went over to uh, Germany, or before we went on the F-104, so that was this one here. That was always my dream machine to fly. You know, I saw that in the movies and it was just such a cool looking machine. That was my bucket list when I was a kid. They sent me to Chatham, New Brunswick and they never made a two-seater Airplane. So first time you went up and you were by yourself. So I remember going up there and I just having a great old time and landed the airplane and I said, well, that was it. That was my bucket list. What am I going to do with the rest of my life now? That's it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Al still remembers when he first became an official fighter pilot, showing us a photo that was taken when he first got to Germany to fly for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Yeah, so when we first arrived over on squadron in Germany, every pilot had to get their picture taken in this pose. So we ended up with this rogues gallery of every pilot on the squadron all up on the wall there. I just arrived in Germany at that point, and up until that point, my experience in the Air Force was a bit of a whirlwind. And I arrived in Germany on squadron, and I became a qualified uh, uh, starfighter strike attack pilot in about two weeks after my 21st birthday. That was, uh, that was a few years ago, and that's, uh, that's still the way I think of myself. You know, even after a 33-year career as an airline pilot and uh, a lot of other flying experience, I still think of myself as an ex-Air Force fighter pilot. That's the way I feel. Like his son, Hal's passion for flight came from his father, who also flew airplanes and was in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Well, my father was in the Air Force, and I was, he, he always had a great interest in airplanes, and I had my first flight when I was about three years old. And he was an aero engine mechanic during the Second World War. He was uh, stationed in uh, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. He worked on cancels. They were out doing the anti-submarine patrols. I kind of got interested in the Air Force from my dad, and then my son obviously got the hook from flying with me. And then my grandson joined the Army. For Al, flying truly has been a family affair. Al has made many unforgettable memories in the cockpit, and even more privileged to get to share great memory-making moments with his son. Well, I obviously had a good career in aviation, and my son got hooked on aviation much the same way I did. Uh, he was flying with his dad. We had uh, occasion to take a small two-seat biplane from Langley to Toronto and when he was 12 years old, and I think that's what hooked him on flying, seeing Canada from 5,000 feet at 160 miles an hour. It's kind of a cool way to see it. Al also attributes the Air Cadets with giving him an opportunity to fly as a young child. It gave him experience in the cockpit and leadership training that he believes helped him to excel. I was always kind of hooked on flying. I joined the Air Cadets when I was 12 years old. I won a flying scholarship and that's how I got my pilot's license. And uh, I would highly recommend that organization to anybody who's aspiring to be a pilot or even just for general leadership training. Memories. Memories hold a power over our lives that cannot be explained and play an important role in shaping our future. For the Canadian Museum of Flight, memories play a key role. Well, you know, the museum is all about preserving memories. And that's, that's what we do here is preserve history. And uh, it was a really uh, unique opportunity for us to go over and become part of the new memory of uh, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the commemoration of uh, the Battle of Vimy Ridge. And uh, for me, I got such an appreciation of what these early World War I flyers went through. I mean, I was up flying this thing with uh, four other period biplanes and we were going over areas of uh, northern France where you could still see, you could still see the trenches and the craters. And it was a surreal experience. It was like being transported back in time. I really felt like I was back there in the day. Uh, such an emotional, uh, mo an emotional flight. When it was for our first FAM flights over in France, they sent us up solo and we, we took our airplanes and we went over the monument at Vimy Ridge uh, just by ourselves, not in formation. And everybody that saw the pilots come back from that first flight said we were all like so choked and emotional that we were, we were speechless. It was uh, such an awesome experience connect back to that day. And uh, as I said, I, you know, I, I just have so much appreciation for what those early flyers went through, the sacrifices that they made there. Their average life expectancy was about two weeks, and not because of the enemy, enemy action, it was just because the machines were so rickety and they had such little experience that they just kept writing themselves off in accidents or, or they got shot down by more experienced pilots. If you, if you managed to last through that two weeks, you became an experienced guy and your chances of survival were much, 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 much greater. I had such an experience over in France when we went over with Vimy. The French people, they live with the remembrance every day because the cemeteries are in their towns and the graveyards are all about a thousand 
thousand graves each, and there's you know probably a couple of thousand all over northern France and, and Belgium. And when you go in there, every gravestone tells a story, and you know, when you can walk around there for hours and you can see. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, it should be a pilgrimage that's on every Canadian's bucket list. It's a life-changing experience to go over and experience that. We we are kind of remote from it because it's all over in France, but the French people live with it every day. You know, we shouldn't go back there and connect with that. That's the kind of message that I would like to get to my kids and my grandkids. Go over and touch those gravestones and remember and, and uh, appreciate what the sacrifice that was made so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. So the value of passing on history, I think, it's fundamental. History is the building block that we advance on as a civilization. If we don't learn from our history, we're bound to repeat it. But really, when you think about history and go back and look at it, we really haven't evolved very much as a species. We're still making the same mistakes. I think learning and preserving history will help us maybe prevent some of that. In addition to the famous planes and stories, the museum also dedicates space and resources to the memories of local aviators to keep their history alive. We've tried to commemorate our airplanes by dedicating them to uh, our earliest British Columbia flyers. It's, it's this gentleman here is uh, Joe Fall. He's a farmer over in uh, Duncan in the Cowichan Valley before the First World War, and he tried to join the, the Royal Flying Corps and they wouldn't take him. I think he was almost blind in one eye. And uh, the Royal Naval Air Service didn't have as high a standards. And um, he became very successful flying these up with pups in combat. And he got his first four victories in this airplane here in Happy. And then our, our other sop with pup is he got his next three victories in that. He ended up with 36 victories, beat Canada's uh, third highest scoring ace. And then uh, he rejoined the Air Force back in uh, World War II and became a, retired as a group captain. So a very successful career as both a farmer and a pilot. We actually have Joe Falls helmet and gloves on display over here, I think, in one of the cabinets. And those uh, gloves and helmet were in this airplane when we flew over Vimy. So we actually took the gloves that he wore in the Battle of Vimy Ridge and took them back over again on the 100th anniversary. So when Joe Fall's son heard that we were restoring his, his uh, airplane that he flew over Vimy Ridge in uh, 1917, he donated uh, his dad's original leather flying helmet and goggles and his flying gloves to the museum with the provision that when we did the fly past at Vimy Ridge that we would carry these over the monument for the 100th anniversary of Vimy Ridge. So we did that. They were in this airplane when we overflew Vimy Ridge on the 100th anniversary. Al also researches and remembers those aviators who didn't land safely and are interned in the local cemetery. Here's a story. This guy's Royal Flying Corps. He's a captain. His name is Arthur Gerald Knight, Distinguished Service Order, Military Cross, Royal Flying Corps. He was killed on the 19th of December, 1916, age 21. So he's 21 years old. He's a captain. He's already won the Distinguished Service Order and the Military Cross. I said, this guy's got to be worth Googling. So uh, I looked him up on the internet. He hadn't quite graduated from Upper Canada College at that point before he joined the uh, Royal Flying Corps. He was an ace with 13 victories. He was the Red Baron's uh, 17th victim. And there was all kinds of stories like that in this, in this cemetery. There are many guests who come to visit the museum. Each has their own experience and memories play an important role for them. I think we have uh, three main types of visitors to the museum. The kids come in there, they're obviously they're excited by look, about looking at all these old airplanes and they just think it's cool, all this old technology. And they might even get to see a rotary dial phone or something like that and trying to figure out what that is. The uh, second type is uh, their parents or whatever, you know, the middle-aged people, they come in and they kind of look at it and say, yeah, this is interesting. And uh, they tend to kind of take it all for granted. You know, The history of it is not part of their history. And it's a shame because I think they could learn an awful lot from you know, paying closer attention to what brought this all about. And then we get the other type, and they're, they're more you know, in the middle and older people that they had parents or grandparents that really were involved in, in one or two of the wars. And they tend to really have a close connection to it. They like to come in and touch the stuff. They can say, my dad worked on this, or my dad flew this, or my uncle was you know, a prisoner of war, and he went through this experience. And, and this really, you can see them, they can really connect with the kind of memories that we're trying to evoke. I remember uh, we had a mosquito bomber out at the Abbotsford Air Show. It was one of the only flying ones in the world. We had a 96-year-old pilot that was uh, out there looking at this thing, and he'd flown these things in World War II. And he was walking with the walker, and as he got closer to the airplane, he kind of put the walker over there, and he kind of shuffled over to the ladder. And as he got closer and closer to the airplane, you, you could almost see the ears drop away. And he actually made it up into the cockpit of the airplane. We boosted him up and helped him up the ladder, and he actually got into the airplane. It was a beautiful thing to watch. 
I think some of the people that are middle-aged and say older people come and uh, they had relatives that were involved in earlier parts of aviation and they have a connection to that history. So when they walk through the museum, you can see them kind of reliving those memories and saying, my, my dad did that during the war. Or my uncle was, uh, you know, he flew one of those. So it's fun to see people make those connections with some of the displays that we have in the museum. And that's the reason why we're doing it. We're trying to keep history alive and bring it to life for new generations. We asked Al to share his favorite memory. My favorite experience is, uh, you know, I've been doing this for over 50 years, so there are so many of them. But most recently, I've got to say, Vimy Ridge was such an adventure, you know, going over there and being part of the flying team that commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, going over to France and the, the, the warm welcome that we got from the French people, just being a part of that emotional experience of commemorating the sacrifice that earliest aviators made. And um, just being part of that whole thing was, uh, was a real adventure. It was probably some of the best flying I've ever done in my life. As our time with Al came to a close, he begins to think more on the history of aviation, what it has accomplished, how far it has progressed, and how it has changed how mankind lives and travels. I think a lot of people take flying for granted. You know, it's, it's so much a part of our life here traveling. It's the safest way to travel. It's, it seems to be the most convenient. But there was a lot of tenacity and determination and sacrifice into make, that went into making flying what it is today. Uh, our first World War flyers, obviously, they didn't know what they were doing. They were like the earliest explorers, and they were just climbing into these rickety kites and learning how to do it. They, unfortunately, a lot of them didn't survive doing it. And then during the 20s and 30s, it was much the same thing. The Canadian North was opened by aviation, and there were a lot of accidents then as well. We've come a long way. I think two years ago was the first year in aviation history where we didn't have a fatality. It's come a long way. We're on Facebook. We have a very active Facebook page and we have a pretty extensive website that describes every one of our airplanes in detail and we've got a schedule of what events are coming up. So if people want to stay in touch, just Google Canadian Museum of Flight CMF and uh, they'll find us. We would like to thank Al French for taking the time to share with us. We'd also like to thank the Canadian Museum of Flight for allowing us to experience what the museum has to offer. The memories that Al shared and that we experienced from the exhibit brought on memories of our own families, friends, and neighbors. The next time you're in Langley, British Columbia and looking for a great way to make memories, be sure to check out the Canadian Museum of Flight. To discover more ways for you to make lasting, meaningful memories with family and friends, like and subscribe to follow along with This Life BC as we explore other unique places in British Columbia to enjoy. Special thanks to Alternatives for their commitment and support with reminders like this to live life to its fullest every day.